Okay, so let's uh, build our visualization and take some time, lead yourself through the descriptions of being in the presence of the holy beings and surrounded by sentient beings and remember the kind of attitude you want to have when taking refuge. So instead of me guiding you, it's good to learn to do this yourself. Let's generate our motivation. And while some sentient beings act in ways that benefits them by creating virtue, other sentient beings also have the ability to do that. But when they are overwhelmed by confusion or misery, instead they use their time and energy to create the causes for more suffering. And so we have what is happening in the Middle East right now, and the tragedy of people who want to be happy and not suffer, inflicting incredible amounts of suffering on each other. And therefore, suffering themselves when the others retaliate. So this is life in the human realm where people often work against their own best interests. So let us have a strong determination not to fall into that ourselves. To not hold grudges, to not crave power. but instead to wish others well. And even to work for their benefit. Knowing that the more we can help others alleviate their pain, the more we will live together with people who are happy, which affects us in a very good way. And so with that, let us generate the bodhicitta and have a united purpose in what we're doing by sharing the Dharma today and all the days that we hear, think, and meditate on the Dharma. So I was thinking this morning about power and different kinds of power uh, because one of the uh, former incarcerated people that I write to was uh, telling me that he goes to the NASCAR 
races where they, the engines make incredible amount of noise. And I asked him, because I have a very frank relationship, I said, why are people so attracted to engines that make a lot of noise? I don't understand it. It's not something that uh, attracts me. In fact, it pushes me away. And, and he said, you know, the engines represent horsepower, and you can, when you have the noise, you can feel the power in your body. Yeah, and so, you know, I guess especially guys, although he said some women too, you know, like that feeling of the power of the engine. So then there's power. I have power too. And it was making me think how when we uh, feel hurt and when we feel uh, powerless, uh, then we seek power, um, but we do it in really... uh, strange, ineffective ways. One way is by getting angry. Another way is by going to sports car racing. Another is, you know, you you read what's happening, you know, with Israel and Gaza now. And, you know, everybody is just seeking power. So for those of you who don't know what's happening... Um, Yeah, the situation had been comparatively calm the last several years. Uh, But it's the end of Ramadan now, and it's hard to say who started it. But at the um, Al-Aqsa, or Akba, a mosque that's on the Temple Mount above the Wailing Wall, then, you know, some people were throwing stones, and so then the police came in, and they started shooting people with rubber bullets and uh, doing tear gas, and some of the tear gas got into the mosque, and this is the end of the holy month of Ramadan. Uh, so there's that, and then one neighborhood in East Jerusalem, uh, they want to evict a few families so the Israelis do so that they could take over the land because the the right wing people say it's our land, but uh, actually it was originally Jewish land, but then the Palestinians uh, 50 years ago traded some of their land in another part of Israel to go live there. So it became the Palestinian land. And the UN, you know, backs that agreement because it was an agreement with refugees. But so now the Palestinians are saying it's our houses and the, the Jews are saying, no, this is our holy land. It's all just dirt, you know. Um, so there's that. And then, you know, so then everything escalates. So the uh, the Palestinians have sent over a thousand rockets into Israel, into, um, you know, civilian areas, cities and towns. And the Israeli uh, army does what it usually does, is it goes and bombs specific buildings in Gaza and assassinates some of the commandos. And uh, so that's what usually happens. That's the usual intifada. What's happening this time is because 20% of the Israeli population is Arab and they're Israeli citizens and they have representation in parliament, but they're not actually being treated equal. And of course, they see what's happening to their brethren in Gaza and in, in the West Bank. So now what didn't hasn't happened in decades is that within Israel itself, the Israeli Arabs and the Israeli Jews are battling each other in the cities. So people pulling other people out of cars and beating them up and setting things on fire and... You know, just it started out as protests, well-meaning, like we protest here, and then evolved into violence and um, 
And it's very alarming to people because this level of violence inside Israel itself usually, you know, hasn't happened in a long time. Okay, so here's all these people. It's it's a really good example, you know. I mean, we look there, but this is how our own mind operates, you know, is, you know, especially when we're attached to honor, reputation, being respected, then when we don't feel respected and honored and and so on, uh, we get unhappy, we feel powerless, and we attack. And so here you have two people. I mean, the, the Holocaust is well and alive in Israel, okay? It was over in Europe you know, many years ago, many decades ago, but the feeling of persecution, because you know the Jews are the most persecuted population in the whole world, 4,000 years more than anybody else. So there's that mentality of, you know, finally we have a homeland, but, uh, you know, we have to defend it. And then what's happening with the Palestinians um, you know, being oppressed and, and the ones in Israel and especially the ones in Gaza and, and West Bank. So you have two sides, two peoples who both feel like they're endangered. Yeah. And unable to see the perspective from the other side. And both feeling like, oh, we need power now to protect ourselves. And so then in doing that, they harm the other. The other doesn't just sit there and say, well, thank you very much. You know, you sent us a thousand rockets. They're really beautiful. We'll put them in our parks. Uh, you know, and the Palestinians don't say, oh, thank you for bombing those buildings. We wanted to demolish them and rebuild something anyway there, you know, so thank you for doing it for us. So nobody does that, yeah. And so people retaliate. And so you have a situation where, you know, even little children are getting killed in the crossfire, Okay. Um, so this is the insanity of the human realm, yeah? So often we think of it as this, this is the place we live, and so it, it, it comes to have some kind of different meaning. It's somehow more real. But when you say this is the suffering of the human realm, then it's like, well, and the the animals have their animal realm has their suffering. Hungry ghost has their suffering. God realm has theirs. This is what human beings do to each other, yeah. And so it's it's a reason to get out of samsara because even you have a good rebirth, it doesn't bring any peace, yeah. Um, and it's also a reason to have compassion for people who are so confused. And to be very humble, because there are times in our life when we are just as confused as them. And when we get angry and retaliate and hold the grudge and do things that are counter to our own benefit, because we feel scared and threatened. Okay? And so to use this also to realize, you know, I have those seeds within me. There's no reason why for me I should be arrogant about it. But instead, I should really work on those tendencies within myself so that I don't fall prey to acting this out and harming other living beings. And then going a step further so that I can eliminate these tendencies in my mind altogether and attain liberation and awakening, yeah? So you can use anything that you see in your life as, you know, it's a real live Dharma lesson. Yeah, you know, in, um, yeah, what we chanted yesterday in the the uh, Four Clingings, when he, he talks about, 
the changing nature of things. And he says, these are in scripture, but uh, you don't really see them. So look at the suffering of the human realm. So his advice is, yeah, look at what's in front of you right now and and see it and let it be the the uh, the Dharma teaching that it is for us. Yeah. So don't just write this down. Try and think about it and remember it. Yeah, because this is how we uh, change our minds. Okay, so now we'll continue with Shanti Deva, who is doing his best to change our minds too, as much as we go. But Shanti Deva, it's too hard to do this. Why are you asking me to be mindful? Why are you asking me to have introspective awareness? Can't you just go poof and make my whole life happy? Come on, Shanti Deva, you know what, what you're telling me. I can't do this. It's too hard, isn't it? Look what he's asking. Look at this. It's so totally unreasonable. Look what he's saying. If I happen to be present why a senseless conversation is taking place, or if I happen to see some kind of spectacular show, I should abandon attachment towards it. Oh, what kind of advice is that? Why do they have? Why do people engage in senseless conversations? It's so that we can come out of the conversation feeling that we're the two best people in the universe because we've bad-mouthed everybody else. Why are there spectacular shows? So we can show off how beautiful we are, how talented we are, so we can get jealous of other people and compete with them and win, yeah? And also so we can get distracted. I mean, those spectacular shows, it's just amazing. Have you ever noticed in those shows that the men have so many clothes on? They are buttoned up with their neckties and, and things like this and long sleeve shirts plus a jacket, you know, and they're like sweating like mad. And the women have as little clothes on as possible. Yeah. And so it's spectacular. The men are at one extreme and the women are at the other extreme. Wow, isn't that cool to look at? And he's asking me to do what? What am I supposed to do? Abandon attachment for that? You know, I mean, everybody talks about the the what the Emmys and the Golden Globes and the and the um, Oscars and you know everybody talk so what am I going to talk to people about if I don't watch this yeah and he's saying not to be attached to it I won't have any social life. What am I going to talk to people about? Shanti Dev is too much, isn't he? Listen for what else he's telling us. Oh. If for no reason I start digging in the dirt, picking at the grass or drawing patterns on the ground. But these are my favorite things that I like to do. I start digging in the dirt. You know, we move the raspberries and we want to have sunflowers and we want to have lettuce and you know, and then you dig in the dirt. Then you can draw patterns in the dirt. All my inner artist comes out when I have a stick and I can draw in the dirt. It's so healing for me to let my inner artist out. And what does Santi Deva tell me to do? 
Then, by recalling the advice of the Buddhas, I should immediately stop out of fear. Fear! What's there to be afraid of when I dig in the dirt? He wants me to be terrified and shake in my sneakers and stop digging in the dirt. It's too hard, too difficult, too difficult. Yeah. So let's try another one. Maybe he'll tell me something easier. Oh, no, look at this. Whenever I have the desire to move my body or to say something, first of all, I should examine my mind and then, with steadiness, act in the proper way. Oh, God, that is really too much. That's too hard, isn't it? Yeah? Before moving my body or moving my mouth, I'm supposed to examine my mind and my motivation? Come on. I feel my emotions. I want to let them out. I don't want to look at my mind. I want to... Ah. I want to be spontaneous. Yes, that's it. I want to be spontaneous. Shanti Deva is... He's not subduing my mind. He's subduing my spontaneity. And so when I'm mad, I want to say I'm mad. And when I want to cry, I'm going to cry. I don't care what you say. Right? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, right? Okay, let's go for it. I got the tissues. Yeah, and when I want to move my body, I'm going to move my body. (laughs) Yeah, why do I have to look at my mind? If I want to slam a door, I'm going to slam it. Other people can look at their minds and deal with it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and if I want to stomp here to wake up the people below, that's okay. Yeah. Yeah, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And then you hear from below, boom, (laughs) boom. (laughs) Examine my mind and act in the proper way. What in the world is the proper way? Okay, this is just all societal convention. You know, and people make up the proper way, the way you're supposed to act, and it's just all their imputation. It doesn't matter anyway, because every culture has their own proper way. And I have my own culture, so I have my own standards of the proper way, and I will act with the proper way. Right? Otherwise, I'm getting suppressed. I am not going to be suppressed. The bodhisattvas should help me. Yeah. It's their job. They vowed to lead me to enlightenment. Why aren't they doing it? (laughs) Why is my mind such a disaster? They vowed to help me. Bodhisattvas. Yeah? You're, you're You're not keeping up with what you promised to do. There's no hope. There's nothing in this world. (laughs) Okay. So you see, everybody has their own interpretation of events and their own interpretation of what Shantideva is trying to say. Okay. First of all, I should examine my mind and then with steadiness act in the proper way. Yeah, it really takes a long time to examine our mind, doesn't it? Yeah. And then if we find an affliction in our mind, 
you know, to have to calm our mind before I say something or do something, then I'm going to be mute for the rest of my life. (laughs) And I'm going to be sitting in this chair for decades, you know, because I'm supposed to to really, you know, look at my mind and, and try and overcome the afflictions. Before I speak or before I move, oh my God. Can I go dig some dirt and release <laughs> and release my inner artist? You know. But then when I dig in the dirt, the ants object. Yeah. And then they come and they invade our our living places. Yeah. I dig in the dirt. You know, and then they come and invade. They're not going to lie down and roll over and say, yes, you know, go ahead, dig in the dirt. They're going to say, if you dig in my dirt, I'm going to invade your house and eat your wooden, uh, wooden, uh, studs. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. These studs are delicious. <laughs> okay. So you see what we have to overcome just to practice the Dharma? What we're up against? But, you know, if we look at our minds and look at our motivation and do something before we speak and and move, we may have less trouble in our lives. Yeah? Something to consider. Oh, no. Now we're moving into another set of, of, of verses. These are the verses where he's really nailing what's in our mind. Okay? So whenever there is attachment in my mind, I should go out and get what I'm attached to. And whenever there is the desire to be angry, I should be angry. I should not do anything or say anything but that. And I should not remain like a piece of wood. I should act. I didn't read it right. (laughs) Yeah. Whenever there is attachment in my mind, and whenever there is the desire to be angry, because anger makes me feel powerful, I should not do or say anything but remain like a piece of wood. Okay. I become stoic. Yeah. What's that that painting of the, you know, the guy with the pitchfork and his wife? American Gothic. American Gothic. Yeah. So I should be like them. Yeah, it gives you a really happy feeling, doesn't it? (laughs) Yeah. So, remain like a piece of wood doesn't mean that. Okay. It just means, you know, the piece of wood doesn't move, it doesn't talk. It just, you know, quietly sits there and figures things out. So whenever there's attachment in our mind, it really behooves us, rather than act on it, to really pause and think, do I need this? Yeah. Do I need, yeah, do I need this? Do I need to say this? Yeah. When I feel people aren't appreciating me enough, do I really need to say something? Or is actually it a quite good thing for me when they don't appreciate me enough. Makes me more humble. An old friend just wrote to me and said it upsets him that he sometimes feels people don't appreciate me enough. And it was like, 
oh, don't say that. That just feeds my arrogance. And it feeds my self-pity, you know. Don't say that. Because then it makes me feel self-righteous. Yeah, and self-righteous anger. Because one person in this universe said that other people don't appreciate me enough. And I've known that my whole life. (laughs) And finally somebody else acknowledged it. (laughs) Okay. No, but it's really true, you know, to try, note what's happening in the mind. And if, uh, you know, sometimes when there's strong attachment or strong anger or jealousy or arrogance, there's this energy behind it, isn't it? It's like, I have to do something right away. I have to say this immediately or else the whole world's going to fall apart. And then we say what we have to say, and 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 the whole world falls apart <laughs> because we said it, <laughs> not because we didn't say it. No, then, you know, we say stuff, and then we have to deal with the fallout of what we said. Yeah, because when we're motivated by either attachment or anger, what we say and do is not going to be necessarily kind to other people, is it? and it's going to infringe on them, yeah, as well as create a lot of negative karma for ourselves. So instead, remain like a piece of wood. So if the American Gothic doesn't appeal to you, think of uh, one of the beautiful Kuan Yin statues carved out of wood, and you become like a piece of wood in the shape of Kuan Yin. Yeah? That would be nice, huh? Verse 49, whenever I have distracted thoughts, the wish to verbally belittle others, feelings of self-importance or self-satisfaction, when I have the intention to describe the faults of others, pretension and the thought to deceive others, whenever I am eager for praise, or have the desire to blame others, whenever I have the wish to speak harshly or cause disputes, at all such times I should remain like a piece of wood. So truly, I'm going to be sitting here my, the rest of my life. <laughs> okay, so whenever I have distracted thoughts, yeah, my mind is bored and so I'm looking for something to think about or look at. And the internet is so good at providing that. Yeah? There's all sorts of things that you could look at. And some are even educational. So that provides a good ally. Yeah? Uh, no, alibi. It provides a good ally. I was just watching this documentary. It's really good. Actually, our motivation was, I am so bored, you know, I want something interesting to watch. Yeah, so you watch, yeah. So, you know, you're trying to follow the Abbey rules and, you know, not not, uh, look at the internet in your room and only look at the internet in a room where there's somebody else. You know, you're trying to. You aspire for that. But, you know, what else am I supposed to do when I'm distracted? Yeah? The internet's so interesting. I could look at all these pictures. Yeah. You know? And then... I could try and figure out what's going on with the Republicans now. Because nobody understands what's going on with the Republicans right now. (laughs) Yeah, they just kicked Liz Cheney out of her leadership position. Yeah, and they think that's going to bring unity and harmony. And then Kevin McCarthy... You know, first he said Trump was responsible for 
January 6th. Then he said the election was was rigged and there was bad, bad, uh, voter fraud. And then yesterday, right after he got Liz kicked out, he said nobody disputes the election and Biden really is the president. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, so whenever I have distracted thoughts, I could immerse myself in that and try and figure out what's... So, somebody asked Biden what he thought of the Republicans, and he said, that's above my pay grade. I have a... <laughs> <laughs> he said, I have a hard, hard enough time understanding the people in my own party, let alone the, the, the other party. <laughs> really, it's a completely... Um, yeah. So it's but it's something you could think about for a long time. Yeah. Okay, so whenever I have distracted thoughts, the wish to verbally belittle others. Oh, but verbally belittling others, it brings such satisfaction, doesn't it? When you see somebody who is not very good getting a lot of attention or getting money or getting a good reputation, don't you feel like it's your obligation to belittle them so that other people aren't misled? Yeah? Shouldn't we belittle other people? Yeah, thank you. You agree with me. Good. <laughs> Okay, so we won't belittle each other because we're on the same side. We'll belittle other people. Yeah. But, you know, the wish to belittle, that's a strong one, isn't it? I've been reading Ruth uh, Bader Ginsburg's book, um, My Own Words. It's quite interesting. And she's the part I'm reading right now, um, uh, this is, n I'm not reading it out of distraction or boredom or anything. It's really educational and I'm learning a lot, you know. And, uh, yeah, so I'm going to tell you what I'm learning. Uh, but what she said, <laughs> it, she was saying is for the, the, uh, judges that they may have different opinions and so on. And in the C Supreme Court, they can, you know, have their different opinions. In appellate court, usually they they try and present a, a unified thing, although sometimes they don't. But she said it's really important for the judicial system to function and to be respected in the eyes of the world that the judges don't personally insult each other, that they uh, may disagree about how to interpret the law, but in doing so, they don't belittle the intelligence uh, or or criticize the other judges, yeah, because that makes people lose faith in the, in the judicial system, as well as in those particular judges too, either the ones who criticize or the ones who are criticized. So yeah, so I found that I found that interesting. I had never thought about uh, how judges relate to each other or should relate to each other for a, a properly functioning judiciary. Okay. So, when there's the wish to verbally belittle others. Yeah, somebody called you out for something you did that they weren't supposed to uh, notice, and you want to bel belittle them. Hmm? Okay. So whenever I have feelings of self-importance or self-satisfaction, I am an important person. I am talented. I know what I'm doing. You know, this is what I do well, and I have degrees to prove it. I have uh, all sorts of things with those little gold stickers on them. You know, the awards you get. Yeah. So I have those to prove it. I, you know, in my field, I know what I'm doing. I have thank you cards. Look at my whole wall full of thank you cards. I am important. I know what I'm doing. 
That's a good one too, isn't it? Yeah. When I feel self-satisfied. What's the difference between feeling important and feeling self-satisfied? There's a difference in feeling, isn't there? Yeah. How do you feel when you feel self-satisfied? How is it different than self-importance? When I feel self-important, then it's more in comparison to others. Mm-hmm. And, um, for example, when I was on vacation, I was feeling self-satisfied just being on my own, and um, the, the competition was not necessarily there. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. Self-importance arises when we compare ourselves to others, and self-satisfaction is just, I'm, I'm good. I wonder if self-satisfaction has more of a sense of complacency with it, where self... Um, Let's see. Mm-hmm. Self, self importance is more like competitiveness and jealousy and yeah, yeah, yeah. And self satisfaction is just like smugness. I've arrived. Yeah, I've arrived. I'm, I'm smugged. I'm complacent because I'm I'm good. And self importance is I'm fantastic, and I'm going to prove that to everybody. Because really underneath that, I don't feel so good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the whole thing that lies behind, uh, you know, arrogance and self-importance is we really don't believe in ourselves. Mm -hmm. When I have the intention to describe the faults of others, But it's satisfying to describe their faults, huh? I mean, certain politicians, don't you want to just describe their faults? Yeah. Or people, you know, who got the promotion that you didn't get? Yeah. We should describe their faults because the boss really made a bad judgment call. Should have promoted me. Okay, the intention to describe the faults of others. Yeah, so that often comes when we're jealous. Yeah, so we think about the the bodhisattva vows. Yeah, and there's major and auxiliary bodhisattva vows about not uh, belittling and describing the faults of other teachers. Yeah, because of our attachment to. Uh, reputation or offerings or you know having a group having a group of groupies follow us around okay never I have the intention to describe the faults of others okay and pretension pretension and the thought to deceive others so these two go together pretension and deception so uh, they're, they're a couple, yeah? So pretension is pretending you have good qualities you don't have because you want to impress people. Deceit, yeah, is hiding bad qualities that you have from other people because you know that they'll, they'll, they won't respect you if they find out. So one is pretending to be something we aren't, That's what you do on job applications. And deceit is, um, you know, covering up your your faults and pretending not to have faults that you do have, which you also do on job applications, okay? And, And what you also do, you know, the whole dating scene. Yeah, that's what the whole dating scene is about, isn't it? You know? establishing a good image so you pretend to be what you think other people think you should be, you know. And then your bad qualities, you know, we hide them until it's a committed relationship, and then you just relax and let it all come out, commitment or no commitment. Yeah, and the other person just has to deal with it because they promise to love you. (laughs) 
Okay. So, but, but, but pretension and deceit, they come up in a lot of areas in our life. Yeah. And we, if we're careful, we can notice it just in very, even very small things, how we will pretend to know things or have different abilities. Even it's tiny, minuscule things, but we don't want to admit that we don't know it. So we pretend to be better than we are. And then with deceit, we hide what we don't want other people to know about us. Yeah. Not a good way to to really uh, win friends and influence people, is it? No. That technique is not, doesn't work very well, but we do it. Okay, whenever I am eager for praise, oh goodness, do we really have to deal with this? Don't we all want to be praised? Don't all of us have a lack of praise in our life? Yeah, we all need more praise. And what's wrong with being praised? It makes you feel good. Yeah, and then you come to Shravasti Abbey where the people are supposed to be so kind and they don't praise you. Yeah, but I I need praise, but nobody feeds my need for praise. They look at me and in so many words they say, just get over it, kid. (laughs) (laughs) But they, they mask it in all kinds of nice Buddhist talk. Yeah, like praise is just, that's attachment. Attachment creates negative karma. You're harming yourself by wanting praise. And you're not really so important, you know. There's countless sentient beings minus one, and you think you're the most important. So just, you know, like, will you shut up already and stop asking me to praise you? You know, you should praise me. Yeah, you should praise me because I'm helping you on the path. (laughs) Okay? So whenever I am eager for praise. That's a tough one, isn't it? You do something, it's like, I cut that log. Yeah, can you notice it? Can you notice that I cut that log and I did a real good job? And we're taking down all that old dead stuff. Yeah? Yeah, we're doing such a good job of taking down all those old dead, aren't we? Aren't we? Yeah. Yeah. And these people, they don't come out and join us. Yeah. We got our own big mess (laughs) on That's no excuse. At least, okay, you can have your big mess someplace else. But you should praise what we're doing. Okay? Don't you have a vow to work for the benefit of sentient beings and cause them to be happy? happy? And when people praise me, I feel so happy. What do you mean, no? (laughs) Whenever I am eager for praise, or I have the desire to blame others, because when they don't praise me, then it means they're stupid, you know? And they're really incompetent. And they have their own ego issues. Yeah. So, I mean, they should get over their own ego issues, I'm not blaming them. I'm not blaming them for having ego issues. I really have compassion for all those stupid people, you know, who blame me for their own problems. But they should praise me. Yeah. Yeah. They should praise me because it helps me. And I can blame them because that pierces their self-importance and makes them humble, and humility is a good quality to cultivate on the path. So you see, we, we should help each other that way. You praise me, I blame you. We both benefit. (laughs) 
Don't you agree? Yeah? Whenever I have the wish to speak harshly and cause dispute, cause dispute? You mean make people turn against each other? Cause disunity? Yeah? I mean, that's what the Republicans are trying to overcome right now. They want to be unified, so they kicked Liz out because she was a hindrance for having a unified front. Yeah? Because she was calling Donnie out for perpetrating the big lie, which now Kevin says it wasn't a big lie at all. Well, he didn't say that. He just said Biden was president. But the big lie, he still agrees that Trump is right, even though Biden is president. So we got kicking out Liz will solve all our problems. Okay, so I have the wish to speak harshly and cause dispute. And um, yeah, it makes for good news. Then more people know my name. Yeah? Oh, so my new hero, Marjorie Taylor Greene <laughs> and Matt Gates. Wow. Whenever I have the wish to speak harshly and cause dispute, I will remember them. They are my role models. <laughs> yeah. And look, it gets you lots of press. And some people will even side with you when you do that. And even they don't side with you, you still get a lot of press. And you know, any, new, any news about you is good news. Yeah, because it means you're important. And when I have feelings of self-importance and self-satisfaction, you know, then... Okay, but Shandi Deva says, at all such times I should remain like a piece of wood. Yeah, why? Why do we remain as a piece of wood? Yeah? Isn't that suppressing, repressing, rationalizing, justifying something? <laughs> yeah. So think about it. Yeah. Think about it. And, uh, you know, we should, uh, there's this story of Ben Kungal in Tibet. He was uh, somebody, he was a robber and a thief and a murderer, and, you know, people were really afraid of him. But one day he was invited into to somebody's house, uh, and they were offering him tea, and they had a whole uh, uh, jar of kapse. Kapse are like the Tibetan fried bread, you know, that their version of cookies. And, uh, you know, it's twisted and it's fried, and so it, it, it's really not good for you. But anyway, people love it. So, so uh, the, the lady, you know, went into the kitchen to make him some butter tea, which also is very bad for your health. Um, but they love it. And while she was gone... He was looking at those kapse inside the bowl. And he was about to do that, and he got this far, and then he went, Amala, Amala, there's a thief in the house. Come quickly. Somebody is stealing your kapse. <laughs> So there's somebody who was practicing mindfulness and introspective awareness. He knew what good behavior was. He had his mind focused on that. And he had the introspective awareness, which was saying, oops, I'm acting in the opposite way than what I want to. 
and he had the guts to call himself out. He didn't, you know, just say, break off a small piece and say, well, I'll just eat a small piece and she won't notice that and I'll pretend it never happened. Yeah, he, so he didn't practice uh, pretension and deceit. He called himself out. You know, somebody is stealing the cops, say. So it um, might be interesting for us sometimes to call ourselves out. Yeah, but it'll really harm our reputation. No, no, you don't want to do that, do you? No. Okay. You'll call me out. Yeah. Okay. So whenever I desire material gain, honor, or fame, whenever I seek attendance or a circle of friends, and when in my mind I wish to be served... At all these times, I should remain like a piece of wood. So I desire material gain. Yeah, you, you know, you want a a new car, you want more money, you want, you know, a, uh, um, what are those famous watches watches called? Rolex. Rolex. I want a Rolex watch. Yeah, I want some new furniture. I want, uh, you know, a second home. I want a, uh, a, um, an RV and I want a boat and, uh, I want some beauty products and, uh, I want some new clothes. This is 44 years old. And I'm still wearing it. (sighs) Yeah. So we want new clothes. I'm not giving this one up. I don't care how old it is. Okay. Um, We, you know, we want roller skates. We want a puzzle. We want toys. We want, okay, So whenever I have the desire for material gain, honor or fame, yeah, I want to be the employee of the month, yeah? In your workplace, don't you want to be the employee of your month, the month? Why don't we have that here at the Abbey? (laughs) Yeah, monastic of the month. Yeah. We'll put your pictures like... Where will we put it? Right next to His Holiness. You can be monastic of the month. Well, and that, we'll put it in the E News. <laughs> yeah. And you know that the E News goes out to so many people in the world. So you will definitely be famous. Yeah. Venerable Fauci, you're shaking your head. <laughs> what do you have to do? <laughs> okay, so <laughs> yeah, so I want honor, I want fame, I want to be known, I want to be recognized. I should be recognized. After all, I am me. And I should be recognized because I am good. Yeah, whatever. I, when I draw the, those drawings in the dirt, I draw beautiful drawings. I should be acknowledged for that. Okay? And I know how to make really good chai. I can make it with a lot of ginger so it burns your mouth and you never say anything bad to anybody. (laughs) Okay. So whenever I desire material gain, honor or fame, whenever I seek attendance or a circle of friends, I want to be popular. Yeah, 
I'm in, I'm in my workplace. I want everybody in my workplace to like me because, you know, that also helps to be employee of the month. But, you know, aside from that, it's to, then they also praise me. Everybody likes me. Yeah, I have a big circle of friends so that if anybody criticizes me, they will. all my friends will stick up for me. I seek attendance instead. Attendance, that's kind of old thing. How about employees? Yeah, I seek employees. Okay, you have to pay, pay employees. Attendance, do you have to pay attendance? You know, assistance. Yeah, I want an assistant, you know. I'll even give them a title. They, you will become assistant to the abbess. Oh, that makes you important. Yeah. There's only 17 monastics, but it doesn't matter. You're assistant to the abbess. <laughs> yeah. I'm assistant to the boss. Okay. So I want friends, I want supporters, you know, people who will help me. And when in my mind I wish to be served, that's all the time. Yeah, I should be served. Yeah, you should cook for me. Yeah, you should peel the, the fruit for me. Yeah. Hmm. You don't want to give me kiwis that are have all that rough stuff on the skin. Yeah, I should be served. People should do my dishes. Yeah. <laughs> my tree uh, gave me a message for this one. She said people should clean her litter box. You know, we we yeah we should serve our kitties well. Yeah, pet them, overfeed them, cuddle them, let them go outside and eat grass and clean it up after they barf all over them. <laughs> okay? So, so even the kitties want to be served, not just us. Yeah. We all want to be served, don't we? At all those times, I should remain like a piece of wood. But then, then, then I have to take care of myself and wash my own dishes and cook my own food. And, you know, I have to vacuum. Yeah, Vac Vacuuming isn't too bad. Unless you have to vacuum stairs. I hate vacuuming stairs. Other people can do that one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Whenever I have the wish to decrease or stop working for others, uh oh, we're getting into sensitive territory here because I made a promise not to do that one. Whenever I have the wish to decrease or to stop working for others, and the desire to pursue my own welfare alone. Well, what's wrong with that? Yeah, I, I should really look at all sides of the story before jumping to a conclusion. Yeah, my biggest contribution I can make is to free myself from samsara. Then none of you have to deal with me again. So isn't that a great kindness I'm bestowing upon you? If I just look out for my own liberation and, you know, then you, you can figure it all out yourself. Yeah. And you'll be so happy when I attain our hardship. Yeah. Especially when I attain non-abiding nirvana and I give up my body. Then I can't talk and I can't tell you stuff. Okay. If motivated by such thoughts, I wish to say something occurs. This time, I should get out the duct tape and keep my fat mouth closed. 
or the alternative is to remain like a piece of wood. So whenever we we are thinking of uh, abdicating our responsibility towards other sentient beings or giving up bodhicitta or just thinking about our own dharma practice, our own liberation, what is good for me, yeah, then we're really in very, very dangerous territory. Yeah, because when we took the bodhisattva vow, we made a promise that until we are fully awakened, we will work for the benefit of others. So that does include working for our own benefit and keeping, in the sense of keeping uh, ourselves healthy, you know, taking care of our body, going to the doctor when we need to, you know, bathing, eating properly, you know, we do these things so that we can continue to dharma, to our dharma practice, okay? But whenever we, we think, you know, I'll do these things just even for my own benefit, and I want to get liberated. I'm tired of samsara, and uh, these sentient beings are really too difficult. Yeah. Yeah, benefiting sentient beings is hard, isn't it? They are so uncooperative. You want to help them. You go out of your way to help them. And what do they do? They kick you out of the Republican Party. Yeah. Or they say that you're telling a lie. Or they say, yes, but... Okay, so it doesn't matter how difficult sentient beings are, you know. Um, we made a promise, and we have to stick by our word. Because if we give up our word, then then what do we have? If we give up the most virtuous intention that there ever is, then what do we have? We have nothing, you know. Whenever I have impatience, laziness, cowardice, lack of integrity, or the de desire to talk nonsense, if thoughts of partiality arise at these times too, I should remain like a piece of wood. God, he's calling out all my behaviors. <laughs> Shanti Deva doesn't let up. Whenever I am impatient, I mean, come on already. Yeah. Can you just hear all the bodhisattvas looking at us going, and the Buddhas too, you know, look, I've been trying to lead you to enlightenment since beginning this time, and you are so uncooperative, and I'm doing this for your benefit. So will you please get it together and stop being, you know, so lazy? Yeah, practice the Dharma. It's just not that hard. Come on. Yeah, can you imagine the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas saying that to us? Yeah, then we'll go demonstrate in the, in the streets. <laughs> you know, but, 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 but. So we get impatient with people, don't we? Because we really know how they should solve their problems. Yeah, they're doing so many things that are shooting themselves in the foot. And we're trying to help them to stop inflicting pain on themselves. And we're trying to direct them to, to a good path because we know what they should do. And they don't cooperate. Yeah. We know where that spatula belongs. And we're just trying to help them. But, yeah, so we become impatient, don't we? Yeah. Come on, change already. And behind the impatience, what lies behind the impatience? 
I should be able to control you. Yeah, and you should follow my advice because I know what is best for you. So I'm trying to control you because I know what's best for you. And I'm just tired of waiting for you to cooperate. Yeah? Do you have people in your life that you wish they would cooperate already with what you know is better for them to do than what they're doing? Yeah? It's usually the people that we are closest to that we have the most advice for. Yeah? We just had Mother's Day. That was the day where we should give all our advice to our mothers about (laughs) how they should be. Father's Day is coming up. We should give all our advice to our fathers about what they should do. Okay. Children's Day, there isn't because we always give advice to children. (laughs) Okay. Whenever I have impatience, laziness. Yeah, so laziness isn't just lounging around, although it includes that. It's also keeping ourselves, uh, as Geshe Nawandarge used to say, being the busy of the busiest. Okay? So keeping ourselves so busy with samsaric activities is a form of laziness. And then putting ourselves down is another form of laziness. Isn't it? Yeah? Because I just, you know, I'm a disaster, so please don't expect much out of me. Yeah, let me do what I want. Don't expect much out of me. Don't don't force me to do anything. I talked to somebody once who told me, because he was uh, not just, you know, the junior named after his father, but he was the third you know, named so the the grandfather, the father, then him, and he felt all this expectation on him of carrying the name of his father and grandfather. So he said he deliberately uh, made mistakes in an effort to try and uh, get them not to expect so much out of him. Yeah, so that's a form of laziness, isn't it? It didn't make him very happy. Cowardice-ness, you know? When I, when I just, uh, yeah, I, have, I don't have a spine. I can't stick up for what's right. Here, the, the text says shamelessness, but remember shame here is um, what we translate as integrity. Yeah, so, because here there's two kinds of shame. The shame where you feel your defective goods and the shame where you know you can do better. Okay, so here it means the latter. You know you can do better and you know that you blew it. Okay, but this the word shame is very loaded and when people hear it, they don't think of that kind of shame. They think of the shame of... of um, you know, being defective goods. So we don't use that that word. So I think, you know, when we have lack of integrity, yeah, we don't believe in ourselves, we don't care about our own ethical conduct, we don't care uh, about our effect on other living beings. Okay? So we, we have cowardice, we won't stick up for what's right. We have lack of integrity, we will broach our own ethical values so that other people will like us or approve of us or at least leave us alone. Um, Or the desire to talk nonsense, which we've already already talked about. It's, It's nice to talk nonsense, huh? If thoughts of partiality arise, okay, 
in Vinaya, what what happens when when we feel partial towards the sangha? We accuse the sangha of partiality, hatred, fear, and ignorance. Okay, so when we want to cover up our faults, when we want to blame others, okay, then we blame others for being partial without recognizing our own partiality. You know? So if we, we are partial and we favor our own family, our own friends, our own tradition, our own football team, Sorry about that. Um, you know, if we're partial and and it adversely affects others, yeah, at these times too, I should remain like a piece of wood, which means I should examine my mind, you know, and see what's going on in my mind. And if it's an affliction, deal with the affliction. Yeah, practice the thought training so that I can see the situation in a different way. And then there's nothing to suppress or repress or justify or whatever. Yeah. Okay, so we have time for a few questions, maybe? Um, I could interpret or see that in um, like verse 46, um, the one where you are not supposed to dig in the soil and make um, patterns and such. Mm -hmm. um, mindlessly, um, that this is also speaking for <laughs> environmental um, protection. You know, you don't um, do things to the earth if it's not, you know, for necessary means. So I find that interesting that um, this is something he emphasized. And the other thing I found interesting is um, 52, you know, if you're inclined to overlook others' needs and want the best thing for yourself, um, that, yeah, I find that for myself such a natural incline, you know, somehow, even as a child, I remember that, you know, this kind of attitude. And it's also um, like how capitalism works. So that he is basically pointing that out, and um, because capitalism is living on others mm. um, and not recognizing their needs and um, yeah, um, sharing it equally. Yeah. yeah, all these things are applicable to society at large. Also, you know, they function on the individual level, the societal level, the international level, the interspecies level the interplanetarian level. <laughs> Other questions, comments? I think in verse 53, whenever I have impatience and, um, you know, I think I'm right and I want to control, often underneath that, at least for uh, people I'm attached to, is some fear that they're, they're doing something that's going to not be a good thing. Yeah. You know, so lots of times what runs that uh, is fear for me. Uh, yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, fear for, fear that the other person will do something that will, is very harmful, that will also adversely affect us. Yeah, and so we need to control the situation. For the pointless activities, digging in the earth, it made me think of what are some modern examples. And I remember I used to play games on my iPhone whenever I was bored. And it's like so completely pointless, such a waste of time. Yeah, it is. It's truly a waste of time. And people spend hours at it. Hours and hours. For that same one, I think about just like if somebody's just tapping their pencil and not aware of it, uh -huh. or doodling. It's yeah. just, by, then by recalling the advice of the Buddhas, I should immediately stop upon fear. Because it's about being mindful or conscientious of what you're doing. Yeah. And so they didn't necessarily have the paper and stuff to be doodling. Somebody's just saying, it seems like um, not just useless activities but not being mindful of 
that you are doing them. Yeah. Because you could just be doing that. You know, people tap the pencil or the knuckle or something without yeah. even knowing they're doing it. Yeah. Well, with all of these things, it's you have that state of mind or that behavior, and you're not aware that you're doing it. Yeah. And so you continue doing it. And then somebody may say something to you about it, and you get defensive. Yeah. But it is interesting to notice uh, our different quirks, yeah. And how, have you noticed some people with their knee, it's vibra- their legs vibrating all the time, up and down, up and down. They're don't, not stepping it like this, but, you know, yeah. I notice that, you know, sometimes when I travel, because you just you see that or, uh, yeah, all sorts of things we do out of habit without thinking why we're doing them. Some of these things are, are not necessarily so harmful, you know. I mean, tapping your feet doesn't harm anybody uh, unless you're doing it really loud and <laughs> or, or stepping on bugs or something. But um, it, it shows a level of not of unawareness of what we're, we're what our body's doing, what our we're saying what are thinking. Mm. Okay. So let's dedicate then.